Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Mina al Arabi, and I am delighted that I get to moderate this session. The power of narratives. This session is being um, webcast, and of course it's on the record because I think all of us here on stage are used to being on the record, so there are no politicians in sight, so we'll be speaking on the record. Um, for those who are online and want to join the conversation, the hashtag is hashtag WEF20. I was told by the organizers to mention that. So power of narratives. We all come here with a story. It's always interesting at the World Economic Forum when we come to these events that we all have our name badges. So you know my name, my title, and the country I'm supposedly from. Often it's linked to where we work. And it's always interesting that we had to take off our badges and suddenly we have to create new narratives of who we are. Yes. There's <laughs> so I will introduce my great panel um, with their titles. Uh, of course, first I have Professor Robert Schiller, who's Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale University. Angelique Kidru is a musician and UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador. Yo-Yo Ma, who very humbly just calls himself a cellist. <laughs> That's and, what he is. <laughs> and Ken Roth, a Human Rights Watch Executive Director. So, Yo-Yo, I'd like to start with you. We were talking about the power of narratives and what is the currency of different narratives that we have. And you put it into great perspective. You said that currency of politics is power, the currency of economics is wealth, and the currency of culture is trust. And so when we're working on all of these three, how do we develop those narratives as individuals, but also how do we communicate them as societies? Oh, <clears throat> what a short question. <laughs> I, uh, um, I think in everything that we do that we can build upon, we actually need a number of fundamental values. And I think trust is essential in any community, in any discipline, in any framing of anything. Um, and certainly, I can't perform on stage with another musician if we don't trust one another, because mm -mm. otherwise we're just, you know, automatons uh, producing something without a connection. So, so that's that's one thing. And I think um, I'm I'm actually thinking that because there's a uh, a lack of trust in in so many uh, from people to institutions to governments that I'm very concerned about how we rebuild a trust uh, into a world that actually is inclusive. So in terms of, of a narrative, if we, if I feel we need a planetary narrative these days because of the internet. And so because we have access, we can't hide, we can't have too many secrets. And so, so if we're to, do, to build a narrative, which actually every time I perform, it is a narrative, right? And so I'm always experimenting with narratives and how it works, how it speaks to somebody in one place or another. And all these things change. And it's, it's an awareness uh, of the other. And in culture, you actually can turn the other into us. And so that's, a, for me, a good way to start building trust. And trust is so important, as you said, across the board. But we have people questioning the trust in our financial systems. And the narrative we've had, and, and you know, many people speak about us here attending the World Economic Forum and the trust in the, in the capitalist system. There are questions about that narrative. So, Professor, I want to come to you about economic narratives mm -hmm. and how people buy into a system that dictates our day-to-day -day lives. Um, how do you build that narrative, but also how do you restore trust once that narrative is, is tainted? Again, it's a big question. <laughs> uh, coming after Yo-Yo Ma talks, I, I, I have a book called Narrative Economics. You can read my book. It's 400 pages. <laughs> but uh, I, I draw a parallel between music and literature and stories and music. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a human universal. Anthropologists specify what's true of all human cultures. They all have music. Mm -hmm. And they all have stories. So I think uh, we're in the same uh, dimension here. 
uh, you're talking about how to build narratives. Uh, that's the marketing department. Uh, I, I've become a, uh, <laughs> I have become a, uh, I'm in the economics department at where I teach. But I've become an advocate of, of their understanding of narrative. Advertising is about creating a narrative about some product. So uh, in, in my book, I tend to describe narratives as not gen successful narratives are not generally the creation of some committee. In fact, uh, you look at novels. What, can you, anyone name a novel that was written by a committee, a successful novel? There's something about human spark and human spirit that, imp that impels narratives. And I'm thinking uh, that economic narratives are just as important. Economics is not in the habit. Most economists are not in the habit of talking about what narratives are going on right now. They, they tend to like to talk about what is the central bank doing. Uh, and they quote statistics like interest rates and price earnings ratios. <laughs> I don't mean to malign my own profession. Uh, I was president of the American Economic Association. I admire these people a lot. But I gave my talk, my presidential address, on narrative economics. Because I think the profession can improve itself if we start to think more clearly about the impact of narratives on our economic lives. Because essentially, narratives is story. And it's the act of right. how you tell that story. And so you're right in some ways when people read just numbers or statistics or there's a very rudimentary way of telling that story, it does feel detached from people's individual lives. So how do you bridge that and not through marketing? Well, I'm a social scientist, and I, I've been talking more to researchers than to narrative builders. That's called the journalism department. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so f for talking to a financial analysts and economists, I, I see them as beginning a new adventure in uh, economic theory that is spawned by data that we now have on narrative. We now have digitized newspapers, magazines, books, business briefs, legal briefs, uh, church sermons, and even personal diaries. And uh, you can search all of these now. It's amazing what you can search. And I think you can find that narratives change through time. Uh, and they are sometimes changed by government. Uh, because people who want, find themselves as leaders in government are people who already appreciate narrative. They already have a skill. And they listen to other people. And they've, they discover narratives that are contagious. And they pile onto them. So I'm thinking that if you were asking, how can we create a narrative of trust, for example? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, give a prescription. What, it, it's a creative thing. I, I'll just close with one example. Uh, a man named Parson Weems, in, at right around 1800, published a biography of George Washington. Have you heard of this man, George Washington? Yes. And he told a story about George Washington, which was, uh, it's very brief. George was 12 years old, and in an impulse, he took his hatchet and chopped down a cherry tree. His father came up to him and said, did you chop down the hairy cherry tree? And George Washington, now at the age of about 12, said, father, I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down the cherry tree. <laughs> now, that's the end of the story. Now, that is not a particularly great story, is it? <laughs> But it's been remembered over 200 I, years. I grew up with that story. <laughs> and maybe it, helped, maybe it helped promote trust. It helped promote trust in George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a <pop>, baby. <laughs> That's it. So Angelique, I want to turn to you, because I think it was very interesting um, what Professor Schiller said, of course, about journalism because we journalists do believe that we write the first draft of history. And sometimes we write it accurately. And sometimes it's opposed by the victors in that history. So I wanted to come to you about that, the idea of who writes the historical narrative. And through your work, what you've been trying to do to change some of those narratives. Well, through my work, what I have to do is to create bridges between cultures. Because I grew up in a household where uh, every time I ask a question, it's answered. 
because my father said, if you don't ask the question and you don't have an answer, you don't know. But what inter is interesting to me in the history is most of our history books, a lot of them have lies in it, especially the, the history of the creation of the rich countries. When you have people working for you for 400 years and you don't pay them, and that they used human being as a collateral to have credit in the bank, and the banking system, everything about the economy is based on the sweat and the blood of a category of human being, and that story is not told correctly, that the people that have been done wrong to are made responsible for what happened to them. I'm talking about slavery simply. Because slavery is there, I always say Africans sell Africans. It was a business proposal at the beginning. So if we want to blame somebody, we have to blame everything we call business. Because if you come with a business proposal to me and then I want to do business with you, if it turns bad, who to be blamed? Both of us, right? So that history has defined the artist that I am. My engagement in that social um, entrepreneurship my engagement in music, how do I turn that narrative around to tell my own story? Because as a black person, when you get somewhere, the look people give you, it doesn't matter where you go. Even in the most liberal places, you don't belong. The, the look they give you is that, what are you doing here? What you have to offer, we already own you. We own you because we tell your story. And there's no way we can get out of this narrative. Every time we try to talk about it, you have a response that tells you, it's been in the past, it's too far away. We can't talk about it. And we are, we are in that kind of no man's land where we have no words. We have no history. We are not human beings. We have been dehumanized. And that dehumanization has profited people till today. So that history creates economy. The economy started with slavery. The money making, tons of money making without paying no one, have created the wealth of the rich countries. So as an artist, how do I, I maneuver in that history? Is by creating music, by doing collaboration with people. And I, I was raised, which is, which is very ironic in my story, is that I grew up with parents, both my father and my mother were educated, and they would never stop telling me a human being is not a matter of color. Do not come back home and tell me I failed because I'm black, because that's the day you're going to see the worst of us. So I grew up being colorblind, basically, because every kind of human being were welcome in my house. It was an open forum for everybody. And then I get out in the world, and then the world just go bang. Yes, the door is slammed on your face. Your story, no one want to hear it. Who you are, no one want to know about it. What you have to offer culturally, nobody want to know about it. So I'm like, you know what, I'm going to force my way through. <laughs> because I have a voice, I have a story to tell, and I'm ready to work with any artist in the world. I, I just go everywhere, I'm, I'm gonna work with Yo-Yo Ma. She even is, was nice to me and said, let's work together when we Shut met. Shut up, man. <laughs> you mean, I was not nice okay. to you, I like you. I'm, That's I'm it. I'm going to get you off, I'm going to get you off. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, 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 don't, get down, get down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> your joy. <laughs> <laughs> Angelique, Angelique, but I want to follow up on this because I think it's really interesting what you said about your parents when they said actually there's no excuse. And you know there's there's many conversations amongst women about this idea of do we talk about you know being a woman and therefore being pushed forward or actually no women have to earn it themselves and, and, and so it's a, always an interesting conversation with mm -hmm. women when you have that. And so I wanted to ask you how would you tell a younger audience today who are who are grappling with you know history that, mm -hmm. that, can, mm -hmm. that we carry with us, mm -hmm. but also want to look forward. I mean, what is your advice to young people who are dealing with these narratives and the changes in narratives? Well, I'll give them the advice that my maternal grandmother gave me. Mm -hmm. Twelve years old, I was coming back from school because I started singing at the age of six. Suddenly, out of nowhere, people I don't know start throwing stones, spitting at me, calling me prostitute. Because if you sing, when puberty kick in. You are marriable. You're not supposed to be going to school, not at all being on stage singing. And I came home that day crying, telling my grandmother, I don't want to sing anymore. She cleaned me up. She sat me down. She said, stop sobbing and tell me your story. Mm -hmm. So I told my grandmother what happened. And my grandmother said to me, I have one advice for you. Whatever you do with it, it's your choice. In this house, did anyone tell you not to sing? I say no. 
isn't everybody in this house supporting what you do? I say, yes. And then she said to me, if you want to live a life and be happy and be strong and bring something to the table to this humanity, let people speak. People you don't know, their opinion can't matter. Let them speak. Because if you let someone define you, you lose your essence. You're no longer a human being. You're just like a leaf that the wind blow from left to right. Let them speak about you, bad or good. Because the day we stop talking about you, it means you're six feet under. That's what I have to say to the young. So, so, so some marketing departments will say any publicity is good publicity, right? So, so maybe, so along Oh, yeah, lines. I mean, oh, ooh la la. <laughs> How many times have I been calling different kind of name? I say, yes, bring it. So, Ken, Ken I want to turn to you because, um, you know, these are powerful stories that we're hearing. Um, but today, of course, the digital world um, is changing how narratives are told. Now here we've seen conversations about deep fakes and there's, there's concern about narratives being twisted and the speed with which a story or a piece of misinformation can take um, over. And so how, when we think about narratives in this digital era, do we, do we deal with that and do we maintain the beauty of individual stories that we're listening? Yeah, well, see, I, we've always had narratives and traditionally, there were relatively few ways to disseminate them broadly. And this gave a huge advantage to governments, for example, because you know, the government always has an audience. Um, they usually would work through traditional media, of which there were a handful, and, and only relatively elite access to them. That was a real privilege in society. And so most people didn't have much of a role in shaping the national narrative. They had to kind of go with a few options that were, were you know, d disseminated in the traditional way. Now, Social media has changed that. And you know, I know social media is double-edged. And I, you know, I recognize the problems here. It can be divisive. It can spread hate. It can spread disinformation. You know, governments are learning how to disseminate you know, bots to try to you know, take control of it. But you know, nonetheless, um, social media has been a huge plus, in my view, because it has democratized the ability to tell narratives mm -hmm. and to disseminate them. And so, I mean, I'll just give one example that you know, people will be familiar with um, from you know, current times. Um, Trump liked to justify his effort to have mass deportations by portraying any undocumented immigrant in the United States as basically you know, a rapist, a drug dealer, or a murderer. And you know, that sounds pretty bad. You should, probably should get rid of those people. You know? And so that was what the national narrative was. And the traditional media dutifully recorded that. We were able to push back um, through individual stories. So, uh, my organization, Human Rights Watch, we actually put people on the border. And with just a video, we would record their stories as to who they were. And you know, who they were reflected the reality, which was like two thirds of them had been in the United States for a decade or more. They all had US citizen spouses and kids. They had jobs. They had mortgages. They were Americans in every way but legal papers. And that is very powerful, mm -hmm. because that does change the narrative, and it has I, two big advantages that I see. One is that you know, stories are always stronger than abstractions. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so the, the public, you know, by operating through individualized narratives, um, has that ability to push back against the abstraction and to show, you, know, you may be saying it's this way, but you know, here's the person. And people remember the person much more than the abstraction. Um, so you've got to get the right person, the right story. But also the fact that anybody can do this. Now, you know, I don't right. pretend that anything goes viral, but anybody you know, can get the word out. You, know, you used to have to, if you had a, a, a different narrative from the official story, you could you know, say it around the kitchen table, you could say it around the campfire, you know, a handful of people would learn. Today, at least in principle, you can get it out widely. And that um, you know, has huge advantages, first because it enables us to learn what's happening in places where the government actually doesn't want you to know what the narrative is. They want to just keep us in the dark. And it's really hard these days to keep anybody in the dark. You basically have to shut off the internet, which in a different sort of way shines a big spotlight saying, there's something wrong here. <laughs> you know? But the, um, you know, it, it also just uh, it allows people around the world to explain what is happening with their lives. Mm -hmm. And in a way that we've just never had before. And I, you know, our access to information and to powerful stories about what events mean in individuals' lives is so much greater today than it was a decade ago. So despite you know, all the evils, and I know them, um, social media has been hugely democratizing in terms of enabling all of us 
to state our narrative and have some chance of getting into the public domain. Yeah, yeah, I want you to um, pick up from there because because that is that opportunity and for that democratization of information. But also, I mean, today almost anybody who has any social media account is a publisher. And so for us as journalists, we say they're not necessarily journalists because there are certain standards, but you're a publisher. You can publish and you can get the word out. When it comes to the arts, there is still very much you know, a, a way of getting your music out or reaching to, to greater people, but you can also be a great artist and, and go viral on a YouTube channel. And so how do we understand where the arts are going, where music is going, and the narrative of music with all those changes, with that democratization between somebody who's got a whole machine behind them and somebody who's in their bedroom with a camera? Well, I think this is a very good question. I can just very truthfully say that um, since 1998, um, I would not have been able <laughs> to do any of the things I've done since that time without using the internet. The Silk Road Project was founded in 1998. None of going to Central Asia, going to Aleppo in 2001, nothing would have been possible. Mm -hmm. Going to, and, and getting Mongolian musicians out with, with what, you know, with, and so that's one thing. And, and the tour that I'm doing right now, um, the Bach Project, I'm going and playing music on six continents as a listening tour to find out what local populations are thinking and what they're, what, what they're concerned about and what they're proud of. And to Ken's point, I think I, I, think I agree with you. And I, I, I hesitate to say this, but um, it, because this may sound really awful and controversial, but you know the NRA uh, thing that says guns don't kill, it's people that kill. Well, I could apply that to, you know, social media, the inter internet. It's another trust issue. It's people that do the fake news. It's not the internet that it enables it. We have developed such strengths in tools and, and that we can actually um, go either way because that's in our nature. Mm -hmm. And that's what I worry about is how we educate ourselves with a sense of you know, right and wrong, gray areas, trusting, telling the truth, and and really having a way of looking at our whole planet in, and asking the question, who are we and how do we fit in the world? Because if everybody asks that, we then actually start to get closer to uh, looking at what the world looks like from many different points of view. So I think that's a beautiful sentiment, but then politics and interests and harsh realities come into it. If we say we have, I mean, again, if we talk about sustainability, for example, which has been such an important theme this year here at the World Economic Forum, we are, it's one planet. There is no you know, plan B, this is it, we have to take care of it. But then the way we're organized, whether it's nation states or communities or companies, there are interests and often it's hard to get that win-win scenario to be agreed upon by the <laughs> actors. So how do, we, how do we bridge that between that narrative of I must win, I must succeed, I must be competitive, and between yeah. we want to create a win-win situation? Well, you, you bring me to the most difficult <laughs> part of my study <laughs> of narrative. How do we, uh, we're actually at a per, per point of relatively low trust. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you seem to be positive about the internet creating, uh, allowing to create trust, but it hasn't worked out that way so much. And one thing is that we have many different voices on the internet. Many people, or maybe most people, listen to the ones that they favor. Yeah. And, and they can create an illusion that everybody agrees with me. So uh, uh, th th that is a, a fundamental problem. That I agree with you, Ken, though, that uh, the internet is wonderful for what it allows in fact-checking. The problem is that many people don't do fact checking. checking. No. They, uh, well, they, they, they will, but only in a limited domain. Yeah. I think look, we've, the internet forces us all to become our own editors. You know, it used to be that you could you know, trust, to some degree, the newspaper editor or the TV show editor. 
And there were problems there as well. You know, there's Fox News. They have editors there too, but they spew. Hey, this know. newspaper editor is. <laughs> okay, what about the. Is, but, is, is, no, but, no, but, but it, I think the point you raised is very important yes, because but, that ability to get different sources. Yes, so in other words, we, we, you know, for better or worse, relied on people to give us what was this, you know, this traditional portrayal of the truth. Now we're getting it without that intermediary. So we do have to educate ourselves as, you know, and, and pick and choose, you know, what, what sounds plausible and what doesn't. There is this sort of echo chamber effect, although, you know, I, I mean, I've seen studies that suggest that the internet is actually less of an echo chamber than people's mm. ordinary lives. Because your ordinary lives, you tend to surround yourself with, you know, a relative handful of people who tend to have similar views. The internet is so easy to get different points of view. So even if, you know, 75% of what you hear agrees with you, you're going to bump into the other 25%. And so that, you know, that forces a degree of critical viewing. But we do, I think, you know, starting in grade school, we got to teach kids not to believe everything that they see on the internet and to be skeptical readers. And, but, but there is, you know, that skill, yes, we have to learn it, but it's within an environment that is much richer and, and has a much greater diversity of, of narratives than was the case, you know, less than a generation ago. So yeah, I but a, I, have a, I have a different yeah. view about the internet. Um, one thing that is really positive for me in internet is, as an artist, Wikipedia is just the, one of the most powerful business cards you can have. Because what you put on the Wikipedia is, you have to be, you, what you put in there has to be accurate. You have to have a link of where the source of what you're putting in there. But apart from that, internet has been an abusive place for a lot of things. The right of artists, singer songwriter, we don't have any right from in the platform that use our music. YouTube, all of those dogs, Spotify, all of that, it's complicated. They pay the record company, the artists are the ones that are cut out of the, 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 the money. So if you are a new artist and you start today, unless you have your own YouTube channel or whatever it is and you make money through another way, if you are counting on your right as a writer, you, will not, won't, get, you won't get a penny. So right. that's one thing about internet that is not good at all. And one thing also that is inter that in internet is really scary for me is bullying people on internet. Mm. Our children are subjected to it. You have predator on internet and our government is not ready enough to put some safeguard in there to protect our children. Me, I'm a mother. So for me, you know, all that is really my, it's eerie for me to, to think that. But, but, for, but if we go back, I mean, to the, and, and these are all valid points, but if we go back to, to the premise of this idea of the power of narratives, because this idea is the, narr is the narrative that the internet allows you to, to, do. to be exposed to all these other things. But like Yoyo was saying, it's a tool. But, and so the tool could also be used for bullying. So how do we take ownership? Could I make a point that maybe some of you might disagree with uh, or might agree, but um, I'd like to make the point that everything that we have, all the ways of thinking that we have, all the artists that have created things, what politics, economics, we invent it. Mm. So basically, we invented systems that worked at a certain time. Mm -hmm. And we as evolutionary beings uh, have to live with the things we invented at a certain time. And we're I mean, always rechecking whether those things are actually serving our interests. That's the service part of it. You do economics, but you think about how it applies, how it actually benefits people well, yeah. eventually. And you're an artist because you are thinking about a narrative that you want people to understand. You're serving the people whose voices are not exactly powerful, and you use the tools at your disposal to, to have sense. their voices heard. And all of these things, all of these acts, we invent. And I want to maybe posit the idea that we should invent the structures that fit the reality of our world. I say yes, amen. For example, when Let's we invaded <laughs> Iraq. <laughs> Let's do it. Right? What killed me was, you know, it was all about winning. And, and I have to say, I grew up with, the, uh, with I, I think, in fourth grade, we study ancient civilizations, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. 
Was there ever a mention of the Tigris and Euphrates, you know, the cradle of civilization, the museum that was unguarded with all the treasures looted? I mean, what, what was the big idea of invading a place and <laughs> actually, and not safeguarding the very treasures that we have, we have declared were world uh, class. I mean, Thank that you. defies <laughs> everything. everything that I've been taught. Mm -hmm. So thank you. So as an Iraqi, I appreciate you raising that. Um, I, was, I, I had warned my audience that I will bring Iraq into the conversation at some point. Um, and, and you brought it in because you know, we have demonstrations at the moment in Iraq um, since October, and 600 people have died, <laughs> 600 young. Some of our brightest stars have died, and over 20,000 people have been wounded because they're fighting to own their narrative. And it's to your point, because when you look at communities and you decide you're only going to be Sunnah, Shia, Kurds, and forget mm -hmm. your history and forget your title, and that, that, that gets imposed. And they're fighting back to reclaim their narrative and be able to tell their own story. And so I'll segue to you, um, Professor, about that, because in, in your research and your study on this issue of, of narratives, you know, we have not only societies and political structures, but even politicians. You know, it became very famous when... Um, George Bush went out and said, mission accomplished, the end of the Iraq war, for example. Mm -hmm. And if a politician goes out and says the mission is accomplished, and then whatever comes, it's not a problem. And the headlines have to take what this official says, because we as journalists have to report what people in, in power say. How do we deal with that as a society? Or if you're, if you're on the receiving end, how do you deal with the fact that you may disagree, but that's what an official has said and declared? How do you change that narrative? Again, it's difficult. What you have to do is come up with a counter-narrative. If you want to be heard, it's not enough to be on a news show once. You have to generate word of mouth. And that people trust people that they meet direct. That's why advertisements often simulate word of mouth. You know, when they're advertising a product on TV, they show someone that looks like your next door neighbor who's... Yeah, yeah. Do you know? Do you like yeah. this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they're trying to create, uh, it's called word of mouth marketing. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem is it's, it's, it's an art. It's not something that uh, I can quantify. It, it relies on experimenting. You try some different story and see if, it, uh, if it's contagious or not. And if it is, you amplify it. Well, can I say that there was, um, just give two examples of counter narratives that um, that um, so in, in the 1980s, not that many people outside of South Africa knew Mandela's name, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So I was in school when there was, you know, students were talking about divestiture of, of investments, and so this was like in the mm -hmm. uh, mid 70s. But since the 80s, the, the number of musicians that actually, you know, Harry Belafonte onwards, that actually brought awareness to this, of apartheid yeah. and Mandela's name Absolutely. out, so that it actually became something, not an anonymous person anymore. anymore. And that was huge. And, and mm -hmm. further back, during the Civil Rights Movement, when there was, again, another narrative out there, and a counter one, and, and I can't tell you that the power of young people yep. who were, were meeting life for the first time and, and saying, why is this that this way, mm -hmm. right? You don't, and you question it, and then it actually takes hold the power of musicians and so many, the journalists, the writers, people that, and, and it's not, uh, uh, so, so when there's gross injustice, at some point, like in Iraq and now, people come out and say the piece. That was before the internet. Yeah. And so, uh, and those are cultural shifts that I think takes people with tremendous courage and stubbornness and maybe, you know, maybe bullheadedness uh, it, to, to change a narrative. And the internet in this era, if we were again today at the place where we needed to free Mandela, internet would have amplified the message to the point where it would take less time to mobilize for him to get out. So it takes us longer time 
because I arrived in, in France in the 80s, and I started going to the concert, being there because I heard about Nelson Mandela when I was 15 years old. Hmm. Um, because we were switching to the TV in Nigeria and I was hearing Winnie Mandela talking about Nelson Mandela. And till then, till I turned 15, I knew nothing about what was going on. And I was so enraged. And when I get to Paris, I say, I want to be part of this march. And I will go everywhere. Sometimes I'll just leave my school and just go, free Mandela, free Mandela. I've done that all the time. And when he get out of the jail, I sat and just take a big, it's like a burden had been lifted from my shoulder. Can, can I, can I um, follow up on the idea of activism and, and the narrative of we must, we must all you know, be, be behind this particular cause? And, and you're right, because pre-internet, you might hear it through some form of media, and then there's a protest march, or, and, and, we all, and we all have memories, I guess, of, of those sorts of things. But now people are quite distant from it and, and you almost worry about the narrative becoming, oh, I'm part of the community that supports X or Y with a hashtag and doesn't take you to the next level of actually sure. being part of a movement beyond the digital. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're bringing up the question, does it doesn't matter whether you go in the streets or not? Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I, starting with governments, governments, they all have a narrative. You know, they're not dumb. And so... You know, to, today, the dominant narrative, you know, for a lot of these autocratic populists, is we are serving the people. You know, there is some problem that everybody acknowledges, whether it's inequality or climate change or you know joblessness or the problems of, of, of globalization or technological change. There's always something, and so the, the populists, their classic evasion is to say, "Oh yeah, I know the problem. The problem is those immigrants." You know, the problem is those Muslims. You know, the problem is the gays. I mean, it's always, you know, some minority. Some scapegoat. Um, scapegoat them, yes. And then, um, so, like me, I'll serve the people. And so that's, that's a very common narrative. You see this, you know, many, many times over. And the antidote to that is to, um, to try to, at a much more personalized level, show what's going on in society. And, you know, I, we're in the middle of doing this right now in Hungary, where, you know, Viktor Orban, with his illiberal democracy, says, you know, I'm serving the people. I'm getting rid of all these Muslims and immigrants. Who's a Soros fellow. Well, he, he was a Soros fellow, and he's point. kicked out Central just, European just University. Yeah. But he, um, so, you know, the European Union has been subsidizing him on a per capita basis more than, I think, any other leader mm -hmm. in the European Union. And he takes this EU money, and he builds football stadiums, which he then, you know, hires his cronies as contractors, and half the money disappears, and you have a bunch of football stadiums where you don't really need them. Now, so we're, in order to counteract this view that he's serving the people, we're talking to ordinary Hungarians and saying, what's life like under Dr. Orban? And we've decided to focus on hospitals because um, when you talk to ordinary people, part of their narrative is you go to a hospital and there's nothing there. There's no medicine. You gotta bring in your own food. You gotta bring in your own toothpaste. There's like nothing. It's so why does this government have all this money to spend on football stadiums when it can't even provide basic health care? And that's, you know, we're just trying to change the narrative by entering into the reality of people's lives. And it's just, it's a matter of, you know, I feel that my job at Human Rights Watch is to, you know, you first of all figure out what are the most important stories to tell. But then you let, you know, individuals who really have, you know, relatively little voice tell their story and we project it. And we project it in writing, but these days we project it visually and through social media as well. And that just, you know, it is so powerful. And it, it just takes you a handful of stories for that to register. So people will then walk away and say, there's nothing in those hospitals. What is this serving the people? Yeah. You know? So, so if, but if we flip that also, I mean, mm -hmm. countries, societies do also need narratives that pull people together. Mm -hmm. so they can be used in a, in, a, in a negative way or in a nefarious way. But then you also need to do, whether it's nation building, whether it's getting people excited around an idea. You know, I remember London during the Olympics, everybody, you know, whenever there's a big national thing to get people together. So how, how do governments also use that in a way that in this era when there are so many other voices? Well, right now there's concern in the European Union that it has lost its narrative which have held it together. And I, I've been meeting people here who, it comes up repeatedly that somehow it has gotten lost. And so I look back at, uh, at the history of, of the narratives in the European Union type narratives. And uh, I find that uh, talk of one Europe or united Europe 
goes in and out of favor. There was a lot of talk of it uh, around 1960, when we became, when they became the European Economic Community, uh, and also a lot of talk in the 1990s with Maastricht and with the European, the Euro currency. So uh, I, I can't explain. Part of it is the forgetting of the World War II narrative. That was a horrible tragedy, and uh, and so the European Union was counterposed as a counter narrative to that. But as that for, uh, began to fade, the European Union narrative needed some support. The idea of issuing a common currency seemed to me it was a brilliant stroke to put a visual image onto the narrative of one Europe. Uh, because, in fact, they did it with such I don't know if everyone knows this. They, they decided to put monuments to European greatness but the, in the form of bridges, bridging people uh, who are otherwise disparate. But none of those bridges, bridges is real, because if they made them real, they would have to, people would figure out what country that was. And they don't put any picture of a human being on their currency, because that would, again, uh, highlight one company. Real problems, country. Yeah. Yep. So, so that was carefully con uh, constructed narrative. And they put it in so that you have, Everyone would be carrying around those notes, uh, euro notes. Unfortunately, we're not carrying them around any, so much as we did before. And I think we need a new narrative. But it has, European Union needs a new narrative. But it has to be one that is uh, somehow contagious. Mm -hmm. And it has to, again, you can't, you can't just dictate this narrative. You can't have a committee writing. The, there has to be some recognition of what is exciting to people. Mm -hmm. uh, to your point, no, no committee wrote a novel that caught on. Well, does anyone know attention. of a committee written novel? <laughs> but I do know of a piece of music um, oh, that was another. written called uh, FAE, as in Frei Aber, uh, Einsam, Free But Alone, written by, uh, I think, Brahms, Schumann, Joachim, mm -hmm. and it's a sonata, oh, maybe, or, and yeah. each person wrote a movement, and it's played, and it it's, it's beautiful. But, it's, um, but I think film is actually a collaborative uh, mm -hmm. Enterprise in there. That's a lot of. But films. still, it tends to come from a novel written by one person. And maybe not True, all. True, but of some, not, some not scripts really. were actually. Some people written. write. So, so different mediums actually can allow for right. things. And for example, you know, the giant telescopes or CERN are, in fact, massive collaborations, collaborations by countries all around the world, mm -hmm. and without their contribution, it would not be made technological as as right. well as as monetary. Okay. So, I mean, so we've just, only got them. Okay, can yeah. go. It is, I mean, the one thing I just want to your response to how do governments build narratives? I think the challenge in this kind of illiberal age is that it's easy to build an exclusionary narrative. Mm -hmm. It's hard to build an inclusive narrative. Mm -hmm. And so, if you look at the narratives that governments like to develop. They are, you know, the flag waving kind. We have an external threat. We've got to rally behind the troops. We've got to protect the nation, and those um, easily define the nation in sort of monochromatic terms. And it's harder for those of us who want to promote a more inclusive national narrative because, you know, you tend to fall back in abstractions like respect or liberalism or you know things that are a, a bit, you know, harder to um, to feel in the heart. And so I think the challenge for us is to find personal ways to portray that narrative, to show the kind of different form of community that can develop from a, um, you know, a society that does respect differences, respects the individuals, and doesn't try to put everybody into some nationalist form. Ken, I think you actually um, said the word inclusive narrative. Mm. I think that's, in a way, key mm. to, to forming any narrative these days, because that's what is demanded, is needed. And I believe strongly that if that narrative that comes out, whether it's written by one person or by a lot of people, um, it comes out, includes the values of, of trust, truth, and service, as in government of the people, by the people, for the people, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's not a new invention. But if that is, is in that narrative and inclusive, uh, includes the Gen Zs that they're going to be 34% of the world population and that will inherit trillions and trillions of dollars and who are consuming based on trust of 
the companies that they buy from and the truth of what is there, that they seek and that want to give service but not to institutions that are far away because they may be untrustworthy. I think working with them generationally at this point will make a huge difference in accelerating the possibility of the narrative for a planet that may come to be. Thank you. So on that note, we have to wrap up because we're out of time. I would say that you're right about inclusiveness, about how we build our individual story and learn how to tell it, but also the importance of knowing how that gets passed on and how people understand narratives. And Ken, to your point, you know, Benedict Anderson's book, Imagined Communities, is oh, one of my favorite book. books. And in it, this idea of the imagined community, and as a print journalist, I love the idea that we were an imagined community of everybody that read the news, same newspaper, and now that's all evolving, of course, if you're part of a certain um, social network online and so forth. So I'm glad to be part of this imagined community <laughs> of uh, thought leaders. Thank you so much for making the time, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Thank you.